Good morning. My name is Danny Gorman, and today I'm going to be reading from Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside, into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, good, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you. Even, even as we continue to be separated physically, it is a blessing that we can utilize this technology to, uh, to encourage one another. This is, uh, this is my first time bringing the message in, in this format. And while, while I can't see you, hope, hopefully you can see me, at, at least from the chest up. Although I wasn't planning on wearing shorts today, I had, had begun my morning intending to, to preach in bare feet. But not that it matters at all in the eternal perspective, but so that you can rest assured I'm, I'm fully set to go. I'm, I'm wearing khakis and shoes. So my great thanks to those who are working behind the scenes to coordinate the logistics and flow of the services. I certainly am ready, like Kyle said, for the day when we can be together in person. But for now, I'm thankful and content to be with you in this way. And uh, though it's been a few months now since we've, since we've been together, I'm comforted by the truth that, that we will have eternity to praise the Lord together in heaven. So as I get started, uh, we welcome anyone from other churches who may be joining us, and, and we trust that the Lord will bless this time together today. Please open your Bibles with me to the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 12 through 30, and, and follow along as I read. I will be reading from the NIV. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault, in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky, as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to, to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not for those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with a father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me, and I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, 
co-worker and fellow soldier who is also your messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him and not only on him, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I'm also, I am more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of, of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Let's open in prayer. Our, our Lord God, we, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we're thankful for you and, and for your son, Jesus. Lord, we look now into your word and, and we pray that, that, that you would use it to challenge and encourage our hearts, that we may grow to be more like our Savior. May we ever be striving to please you. Amen. Well, the, uh, the majority of the time I've spent studying and prepared for this message has, has been within these past several months where restrictions have been imposed because of COVID-19. And as, as I've said, I, I miss being with you all. And you may remember that this weekend, this, this Memorial Day weekend, was supposed to be our annual church retreat to, to Camp Hebron. It was a sad decision to have to, to have to cancel it. Indeed, there are some dy dynamics of this quarantine effort that have been less than desirable. But, but there's also been some consequences that I, that I found to be a blessing. I have enjoyed the increased amount of time at home that my family and I have been able to spend together. We play, play board games and we've done puzzles and we've shot hoops in the driveway. Uh, also, as, as you're likely aware, the leaders at chapel have made intentional efforts to, to divide up the chapel directory each week and to try to make contact with each family to check in and, and offer encouragement. It turns out that this has been a great blessing to me too. I have, en I have enjoyed talking with many of you on a, on a level or a depth that I, I just haven't had the opportunity to do before. I pray the conversations have been equally encouraging for you too. You know, relationships, they're like that. They can grow and flourish just by having a conversation or in the case with Paul with the Philippians, through a letter, sharing a struggle, offering encouragement, inquiring about need, just communicating and listening, truly listening, can enhance a relationship. If someone for the outside were, were to be able to hear the conversation or, or see the letter, they may not be familiar with all the personal details, but they would likely get a sense of the relationship, the purpose for the communication, and, and the overall tone. Even in our modern day text messages where we, where we drop greetings and pronouns and other traditional formalities in an effort to keep the message under 140 characters, we, we, we do still tend to add emojis, gifs, or, or memes to help us ex, uh, express our point. Because conducting our interpersonal communication for the desired result, well, it depends heavily on the tone that we apply to the words or characters or pictures that we insert. The 41st president of the United States was the late George Herbert Walker Bush. President Bush was, was born in 1924. In 1942, on his 18th birthday, amid World War II, he enlisted in the United States Navy. One year later, he received his wings, becoming the youngest naval aviator. 15 months later, while flying a combat mission, his plane it was shot down near a Japanese outpost island. The sole survivor of his three-man crew, he was, he was rescued at sea by a U.S. submarine. A year later, the the war was over and he had married Barbara and was released from active duty. He would go on to, to co-found an oil company. He would enter politics, serve in Congress, serve in the UN and as the CIA director, all before becoming Ronald Reagan's vice president. He would himself be elected to the presidency in 1988, serving one term there. Throughout his life, President Bush was, a, was an avid letter writer. In 2013, a biography was published that encompassed a great number of his writings to, to himself and, to, and letters to others printed in chronological order. As I read through a variety of his writings, I, I was amazed at his perspective. Here was, here was a man who had, who had seen a lot. He had been a part of so much history. He had held important positions, and, and it would have been easy for him to have filled his writings with, with grand language and a lofty perspective. But it was not like that. To, to his closest friends, he would occasionally question why he had not perished like the rest of his flight team. He was often 
humble and reflective in the appreciating the, the simple things and, and valuing personal relationships. With a quick wit and a positive tone, he penned many letters to others, encouraging them on and sharing in the burden of the times. As vice president, he even wrote a thank you once to a, to a lady who didn't even know, um, who he didn't even know, who, who had donated a piece of furniture that was in use in his office. He did it just so she would know where, where it was and that he appreciated it. As the unintended reader of these letters, I, I can feel a sense of the relationship, the purpose for the communications and, and the overall tone in his writings. As I read and study the book of Philippians, I, I experience the same thing. The apostle Paul, he's, he's writing to people he loves, people who he's familiar with, fellow believers, partners in the gospel, as Paul Dunn pointed out a few weeks ago. I can hear the relevance, uh, the relevance of, the, of the letter for, for our own church body too. Our passage today opens with the Apostle Paul referring to the Philippians as his dear friends. The letter to the Philippians, it, it seems different than, in its tone than, than the letters to some of the other churches that Paul wrote to. It seems to me Paul's aware he is talking to a mature audience. We, we talked about that some last week. A church who has been walking by faith and has been obedient to the Lord. Paul does refer to his own authority as an apostle, but it's done in a less pronounced way. And there may have been issues that he was aware of in the Philippian church, but he is, he's able to gently guide the readers through to his point. Like a father figure or a, or a mentor with a receptive successor, Paul is, is challenging his readers on in the faith by offering guidance in a positive tone and appreciating personal relationships. I, I was greatly encouraged by this. I've also been appreciating the messages in this series. And if you too have been following along, you will remember that the main themes from each of the past messages have been encapsulated by a phrase helping to focus our thoughts for the, in the theme for, for each message. There was be ambassadors, be partners, be worthy, be unified, be mature. And today with the series, in keeping with the series, we will, we will study the charge to be mindful. As we study the passage today, let us, let us watch for aspects that Paul instructs the church to, to be mindful in. Dynamics to challenge our mindset and our motivation. We will generally look at how Paul guides the readers through, through being mindful of their attitude, mindful of their work, mindful of their mouth, mindful of joy, and mindful of examples. So let's start now with how Paul begins our passage in verse 12. Nearly every translation I looked at, all, all, almost all start this section with the word, therefore. And as we know and remember even from Bill's message two weeks ago, when we see that word in scripture, we're wise to ask, what is the therefore? Therefore, right? It, it, it references something earlier, and so we need to look backwards. In the preceding chapter, chapter two, I'm sorry, in the preceding verses in chapter two, Paul, Paul he's, made a, he's made a big statement. In verse tell, five, he tells the church something that's, that's important, something that is the influence for a number of points that he intends to communicate. What's this big point? Well, Paul tells the Philippian believers that their attitude, well, it should be the same as Christ Jesus. That's pretty big. The emphasis is, is on how they work and serve one another. Paul then goes on to proclaim some of the key attributes of Jesus in, in verse six to 11. We looked at these. Jesus himself, he, he made himself a servant. He was humble unto death on the cross. He's, he was obedient to the Father. The Lord Jesus has been exalted over all to the glory of the Father. Amen. The opening lines of our passage today, Paul carries, carries the thought forward. Because the attitude of the church should be the same as Christ Jesus, because of that, Paul has some instructions to give. Interlaced, though, in this opening verse is, is some evidence that Paul is writing to mature believers. He, he, he calls them my dear friends, as we said. He points out that they have been obedient when, when he's around that and when he's not. Those are mature references. He's writing to believers who are, who are walking with the Lord. Paul has communicated what is good, and, and he spurs them on to, to what's even greater. Paul lays the groundwork for, the challenging, for challenging the church uh, onwards. See what, he's, see, what, see what he says to do for them to do in the end of verse 12 and verse 13. He tells them to continue to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. One of the aspects here that, that really stood out to me was the word continue. 
Now, I realize not every translation has that word listed, but I, but I believe the concept is there. The New King James uses the term, but now much more. In all, the Philippian church, they, they've been doing it. They're walking in the way. They're obeying what has been laid before. So now, what's Paul's new charge? Well, it's to continue, to press on, to keep on keeping on, just like we heard last week. It's the, it's the year 2020, the year for the uh, Summer Olympics in Tokyo, Japan, or at least it was supposed to have been. Two months ago today, the Olympic Committee met and they publicly declared the 2020 Summer Olympics, well, they're going to be postponed until the summer of 2021 due to concerns from COVID-19. I wonder what that day was like for the uh, Olympic coaches. You know, that the athletes, they're ready. Their mindset was prepared for the competition this summer. They have been training for at least several years, many even longer. What does a coach say at a time like that? How does, how does the coach keep the, the fire lit, the focus sharp, the drive alive for another year? Surely they're gonna run out of catchy slogans before long. Uh, some coaches, they may say the delay, that'll, that'll prove which athletes are the most determined. Maybe they will point out the practical, that the additional time will help the athlete get stronger. Conceivably, some may say the, uh, the additional time will help athletes' skills become even more refined. And perhaps some will even find comfort in that there will be more time to evaluate the competition. But most of all, the coaches will say to their athletes that the athletes must do, do one thing. They must continue. You know, it's important for athletes to have coaches. The athletes themselves, they're the ones with the abilities, the skills, the talent. But the coach, it helps them stay, stay focused and, and reach a greater potential. The coach, the coach helps them look ahead to what they need to prepare for next. The coach is a resource to turn to when, when problems strike. You know, these truths, they're present in our spiritual life as well. And so so I, let me ask you do, you, do you have someone who coaches you along in, in your Christian walk, a believer who is more advanced in the faith, possibly someone who's older, but it, it doesn't need to be, someone whose influence and example keep you continually pushing on in a way that helps you grow, grow spiritually? Likewise, is there, is there someone the Lord has placed in your life that, that you can be coaching along? It's a beautiful thing how the Lord works and places people in our lives Consider who in your life may be a good spiritual coach for you. Consider who the Lord might have you to be a spiritual coach to. As we can see from the perspective and the, and the tone in this book, there is, there is joy in the Lord when we work together to become more like him. So back to our passage and, and Paul, as he begins to offer some instruction, he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, taken out of context, some may read this, this as, a, as a works doctrine in which a Christian must, must earn their salvation. But that's not the case. We, we know from a, a myriad of other passages written by Paul and others that salvation comes through faith alone. In fact, no deed can help us. We remember Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 where it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a, a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The term, uh, the term work out in our passage, verse 12 here, it's, it's ironically similar to how, how we may use it today when we, were going, when we would go to exercise at the gym. We're going to go work out. We're going we're gonna to pump iron. We're going to do some cardio. We're going to exercise. We're going to use our muscles in a complete way. Some, some commentators, they indicate the term work out here is well described in how a farmer would work a field, working it completely, getting the most from it thoroughly, recognizing that there's a, there's a sense of time to when the work must be done. Likewise, the term fear and tremble, that, that portion of us working out our salvation refers less to an obedience because of, of terror than it does to a, a feeling of regret of failing to do anything worthy for our Lord and Savior. You know, the Christian life, it, it's not secured by works, but it is clear that it should involve works for the glory of the Lord. There is personal responsibility. Earlier in this service, my son Danny read the, the parable of the talents from Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. The theme of that parable is, is similar to this, word, this verse. Christ is our king, our master. He's, he's entrusted us with 
with talents, gifts, and abilities, and physical blessings, and we would be wise to use them for him. For no one knows when he will return. What a worthwhile effort it is now to, to work out, work the field, to be in service for him. What a reward in that day to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your master's happiness. So we're talking about working for the Lord, doing things, giving, serving, obeying, actions. These aspects involve an effort on the part of the believer. However, there's an important point here in verse 13 that, that shouldn't be missed. While it does take an effort on the believer's part to live for the Lord, it should be made clear that, that it is God who works in us that enables that to happen. The verse tells us that he works in us to will and act. He's working on the inside so we can have the inner, the inner want to, and so also we can do the work on the outside. We know God is faithful and his word is true. He is working within us and, and he's faithful to help us. So why, why does God work in us and through us? Well, the end of verse 13 says, says it's all for his good purpose, for his good plan. While salvation, while salvation by faith, it's an individual decision, working it out has both an individual and a, and a corporate aspect. Largely, Paul is writing to the Philippian church as a group in this book. Given the way the letter is written, it doesn't seem like this concept is, is foreign to them. They're, they're mature. They understand. But what is written to the group applies to the individual first. And Paul transfer, it transitions from, from broad language to some specifics now, from working the field generally uh, to how you would handle issues surrounding certain crops, if, 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 if you will. How Paul knew what the issues were, well, that's not clear. But Paul lays out some practical applications for Christians living out the, living out the therefore, those striving to have that attitude that is the same as Christ Jesus. Paul gets right to it in verse 14, stating that believers should do everything without grumbling and arguing. Some translations say, complaining or disputing or, or some combination of these. Whenever I hear verse 14, I, I think of a homemade country craft sign that used to hang above my mother-in-law's stove. It read, thou shalt not whine. It was apparently hung there to thwart off any expressed displeasure at whatever dish was being prepared for dinner. I believe that is similar to what the, the message is here. Look at, look at verse 15. So that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. I don't think that the generation the, Phil, the Philippians lived in was any more crooked or depraved than the one we live in now, nor do I think it was any worse than the generation of, of Israelites that, that was miraculously delivered from slavery in Egypt. That generation had seen signs and wonders that, that we can only imagine, and yet it was not long after their exodus that they began a habit that would, that would revisit them over the years, the sin of grumbling and complaining, of whining, against God, revealing a lack of faith that that would be at the root of an entire generation perishing in the wilderness, grumbling and complaining, arguing and disputing. These are not traits of having an attitude that is the same as Jesus Christ. Now, I've heard it said that there is, uh, there's only one thing that's more contagious than a, than a good attitude. The implied answer to this open-ended statement is, is a bad attitude. And it's true. The contagious mindset swept through the camp of Israel. Now, Paul maintains his positive tone here, but the message to the, to the, is clear to the Philippian church. Complaining against each other, grumbling against each other, arguing and disputing, they're, they're not traits that are becoming of Christ and his followers. Now, grumbling and complaining can be a hard sin to detect in oneself. Excuse me, oftentimes there is an issue, or at least half an issue, that has caused the grumbler to be discontent. And is so often true, the issue isn't really the issue, though. How, of, how we end up responding becomes the bigger problem, doesn't it? One commentator advised that, that grumbling, it's like, it's like bad breath. It's easy to, easy to detect in others, but hard to recognize our own. So why do we grumble and complain? Why do we do it? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of simple, right? It's because we don't like something. Something's gotten our way, it has, it has cramped our style. It will cause us work now to fix it. Per, perhaps we are operating under some preconceived notions about someone else's intent, or sadly, maybe we have stored up bitterness, or there's past unforgiven situations that, 
that taint our thinking. Now, certainly there are things that happen or that are wrong that we, that we need to address, and that may not be easy or fun, but it can be done in a manner that doesn't include grumbling and complaining, especially towards one another. But oftentimes the better course is just to, to cover the issue in love, reset our mind with joy, realizing that by doing so, we are serving the Lord in this way. Really, our grumbling and maybe against God and, and, and where he has placed us or the things he has allowed in our lives. At the root of a grumble or a complaint, the dispute or the argument is, is generally just selfishness. Individuals looking out for their own interests first. Look back at uh, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Do you remember the, the Mother's Day message a few weeks ago that Bill brought us? We, we recalled how moms are often good examples of esteeming others more important than themselves, and how moms often set aside their own interests for the interests of their families. Well, that theme that's continuing here, Paul is, is weaving this theme through the book with a full expectation that his beloved friends will, will hear the message and adjust their conduct appropriately. This is a good challenge for us individually and, and as a church too. Don't miss, in the beginning of verse 14, the, the everything or in all things. The scope of those encompassing terms, it, it can be convicting. I must admit to you that uh, you know studying these verses has made me made me more aware of my complaining. Uh, COVID nineteen restrictions have been an easy source for me to to rant against. On one hand, I've, I've been praying for our leaders, and on the other, I've been grumbling about their decisions. It's wrong, and I'm I'm sorry I've fallen for it. Even in the midst of these trying and unprecedented times, I I should be focused on being outwardly thankful and rejoicing that, that this is what the Lord has for me right now and looking to find ministry in it. But in this time of fear and uncertainty, it, it, it almost seems justifiable to, to complain. Yet I'm sure that's probably what the Israelites thought as they were led through the wilderness among hard circumstances themselves. So taking a lesson from them, I, I can remember that this is a time, like all times, to, to trust in the Lord. Turning my vision from my desires to what the Lord has done, I have so much to be thankful for. I look backwards on my life and, and I see the, the Lord's hand so often. I, sh I should look forward too, knowing that he has a plan and his good purposes are there as well. It's easy to lose focus though, and, and I'm disappointed to say that there have been a few times over the past couple of weeks that I've, that I've found myself in the midst of my coworkers complaining and I feel regret. I wish I could go back and take those words, especially when I look at why Paul is telling the Philippians to abstain from this conduct. Look with me at our, again at our passage. Verse 14, do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Listen here. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Apostle Paul, he's reminding his audience of something that I suspect they already know, and, and I suspect that we know too. Believers who strive to make their attitude like that of the Lord Jesus, well, they stand out in this world. They stand out like shining stars, like salt, like light, like a city on a hill. We are different, and the world takes notice. It certainly took notice of the Lord when he walked the earth. That difference in us, whether it's yeah, whether it's putting others first, being humble, willingly being a servant, or, or not grumbling and complaining. Well, it gives an opportunity for those around us to ask, why are you different? It gives us an opportunity to share the Lord, to hold out the word of life, the opportunity to have his saving power transform another soul. So my fellow believers, I, I challenge you, how are you doing in this area? Perhaps you're like me and and the recent pressure of changed circumstances has put you in a place that the grumbling and complaining is, is something that's easier or more frequent in your life. And perhaps this is something that the Lord's been working on in you for a longer time. I would challenge each of us to be in prayer about this, to be asking God to reveal our shortcomings and to help us in his strength to be over to come this, this, this bad breath so that we can be an effective testimony for him and an encouragement to one another. How regretful we may feel if we were to ever know that the kingdom of God was, was not increased, that the talents were wasted because of our grumbling and complaining. You know, possibly 
you're listening this morning and, and you don't know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. It may be that you're not sure of your eternal standing with the God of creation, the Almighty, the Master of everything. Like the parable of the talents we read earlier, the Lord Jesus, he will return one day. Everyone will be called into account. Romans 3.23 tells us that, that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We all do say or think things that are wrong. Romans 6.23 also tells us that the cost for sin, well, it's death. However, though, the Bible outlines the hope we have in Jesus Christ, that we can be saved from our sin. Salvation comes through faith, by believing in the perfect work of Jesus Christ. Romans 10.9 tells us that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus Christ died and paid the price for our sin and then, and then rose again and is alive as Lord and Savior. When we submit and we accept that, we are a new creation. We are, we are believers and we can have a relationship with him. Just as relevant as it was to the Philippian church 2,000 years ago, it is, it is just as real today. And though we may still struggle with sin, whether it's, it's grumbling and complaining or some other sin, we can, we can be assured that Christ has paid the ultimate price for our sin. As Lord of our life now, we should strive to please him. Our priority in this life goes from being, being focused on ourselves to being in service to the one who's lifted our great burden. If you don't know this to be true in your own life, I encourage you with every ounce of seriousness to talk with someone here at the chapel. For there is no greater decision in life than this. As we heard in, in week three from our brother Tom, the, the Apostle Paul, he's writing this letter to the Philippians. He's writing it from, from prison, from jail. He's in jail because of the gospel. Now, he's hopeful but unsure on his release from jail. Paul's freedom is restricted. He's been distraught. He physically can't see the believers he wants to be with. He has to use other means to send and receive information. Some of, some of that sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? And though we feel constricted and, and long to be together, I, I think we'd all agree that Paul's circumstances were worse. If anyone had a reason to grumble and complain, I, I think he would have. But he didn't. He saw his circumstances as, as given by God and an opportunity to continue ministry in a different way. As we've continually seen in this passage, Paul's positive tone, it, it continues to carry forward. He's just told the believers not to grumble and complain, to, to be a shining testimony and to hold out the word of life. Now look what he says next, 16b through 18. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul is saying here that the, that the Philippian church is a ministry that he's invested himself in. That on the day of Christ, he's ready to celebrate that they are a body of believers working for the Lord. He sees his own ministry as, as just a drink offering being poured out on the top of the Philippian church's ministry. Their sacrifice and service to the Lord. Good on top of good. Not for Paul's own glory or gain, but for the pleasure of the returning master. That mindset, despite his circumstances, well, brings Paul joy. Sacrifice and service for the Lord bringing gladness and joy. Paul has that, and he encourages the Philippian church to find it as well. To be joyful. Overall, this is one of the main points throughout this whole book. <clears throat> I'm amazed by Paul's encouragement. I, I wonder how it, it impacted the Philippian church when they, when they first read this portion. How it was maybe explained or, or reinforced by Epaphroditus as he explained in detail Paul's current state and yet his joy for service to the Lord. Maybe from there everyone examined their, their own lives and circumstances, both individually and corporately among the believers. And I can't help but wonder if there were some, maybe some tinges of regret among them for their attitudes or their grumbling or perhaps a realization on, on why they've been lacking joy. You know, to be honest, sometimes sometimes our ministry, our sacrifice and service to the Lord, well, it can, it can feel like just that, just sacrifice or, or service. It's not until we adjust our mindset, our attitude, to strive to be like the Lord Jesus, 
that we can be glad and, and find joy in what we're given. Giving of ourselves, being thankful, working out, working the field for his glory. You know, it's, it's easy to lose sight. It's, it's easy to forget. But oh, what a wonderful and patient Savior we have. I pray that we would each be encouraged to remember that perspective. But perhaps Paul was thinking that it would be easy for his mature friends to lose sight or, or forget those words as well. So Paul finishes out our passage today by talking about, about two men that the Philippians knew well and that they would soon be able to see again. Paul really talks these guys up. Paul's indirectly saying to his readers, emulate the godly traits of these two. The example and physical presence of these men would soon give a reminder to the points of instruction and encouragement that, that, that Paul's just written down. There is one reinforcing quality that both men share that, that really stands out to me. It's a quality we've talked about today and that has been seen in earlier passages as well. So let's look at these portions from our remaining verses. Verse 19, I hope in the Lord, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interests, not for those of Jesus Christ. Skipping to verse 25. But I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is, is distressed because he, you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. The remaining verses in our passage today, they talk of Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now, Epaphroditus, he was a member of the Philippian church, and he had come to bring a gift to Paul. He stayed and assisted. He fell sick and almost died. Epaphroditus became distressed, not at his illness, but that he learned that the church had heard of his condition. His concern was more for others than himself. His, his inner mindset, his attitude, well, it becomes outwardly clear. He felt bad that the church was likely feeling bad for him. His priority wasn't in, in milking his condition for pity or recognition. It was much the opposite. His concern was for others. So Paul indicates he's going to be sending Epaphroditus back. Epaphroditus was likely the carrier of this letter, this, this book that we are studying to the Philippians. It's almost certain that by by the time that they would read those words, they would have already been happily reunited. And we have Timothy. Timothy, we, we, we know he was one of Paul's most trusted partners. Paul considered him like a son. A younger man, Timothy, had matured in the faith and, and he had proven himself. We know that Paul would send Timothy to, to faraway places to deliver messages, to see how things were going, <clears throat> and to strengthen churches. It seems like Paul was likely intending to send Timothy to the Philippians soon, but was probably not going to do so until he, that's Paul, finds out his own situation, how, how his situation in prison is going to work out. Paul says of Timothy in verse 20, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare, for everyone looks out for his own interests, not for those of Jesus Christ. The implication here is that Timothy, unlike most, has the genuine interest of others at heart. So both these men, Timothy and Epaphroditus, they were, they were godly men who Paul built up in his description of them in their work. And I would petition that, that Paul is showing the believers in, the, in, in and through the lives of people that they know what it looks to like to, to live out putting on the interests of others before their own. Indeed, if we look closer at these final verses, we see that Paul too is, is living out this trait. Despite his own needs, his own condition, Paul is wanting to send two of his best away from himself so that others may be encouraged. I, I picture this letter arriving in Philippi, the believers joyfully assembling to welcome Epaphroditus, the letter being read, Christians being encouraged, challenged, giving thanks. I imagine the body growing in their love for the Lord and their love for one another as they strive by the, by the working of God within, to emulate the attitude of Jesus Christ. 
my friends and, and fellow believers of Forge Road, we are, we are very much like the Philippians. Though we can't be together physically yet, we can, we can read these words, take an encouragement, be challenged, and give thanks. While we don't have Timothy or Epaphroditus, we have been blessed with other godly examples in our midst who, who like them, point us on towards the attitude of Jesus Christ. I'd exhort you to take time to pray and, and be sensitive to the, to the work the Lord is doing within you. Then look for ways to resist grumbling and complaining, but seek opportunities to look out for the interest of others. Ultimately, there is joy when we work for God's glory. I will pray and turn it over to Paul for a song and Kyle to close us out. Our God and Father, we praise you for how you work. Lord, we are grateful for the new life we have in Jesus. We ask that you would be listening, that we, that we would be listening for the, for the voice of the Spirit um, and we're willing to put ourselves aside and to take on the attitude of your son, your precious son. Thank you for the people you have placed here in this body and help us to work every day for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.